Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News senior White House and political correspondent covering my sixth presidential campaign cycle. Hard to believe. Most of the time I'm here at the White House covering President Biden, who's expected to be the Democratic nominee for president again in 2024. Let's first lay out what we're going to be doing here until at least next November. We want to show you what it takes to cover a race for the White House, both out on the campaign trail and here at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's expected to be another close, tough race. At this point, the president appears headed for a rematch with former President Donald Trump, the Republican Party's frontrunner, who still faces competition from former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and businessman Vivek Ramaswamy. And then there's the potential for one or several independent candidates, as yet another guy this week suggested he might enter the fray in an interview with CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell. Senator, the big question everyone's asking is, will you run for president? It's not about me. It's not about the next election. I keep telling people, this is a movement. Are you thinking about running for president? I don't know what the future lies. I know that we can't continue the direction we're going. That's why Senator Manchin says he wants to mobilize the middle. People feel politically homeless. That I feel politically homeless. You do? Mm-hmm. The West Virginia senator says he won't vote for Donald Trump and isn't sold on Joe Biden either. Do you think President Joe Biden deserves a second term? I think the people make those choices. I can't make that choice. But you're I'm a Democrat. Going, I'm a Democrat. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an American first. I'm an American. I'm an independent, I think. I don't know what I am. I can tell you this. I feel comfortable working with both sides. From now through 2024, we'll strive to cover what actually affects voters, a little bit of the campaign roadshow, and what's motivating Americans to vote. Issues like the economy, access to abortion services, the crises overseas, and immigration are already proving to be top voter priorities. And you'll be choosing out of a pool of people vying to do the best for you and your family. So we'll also keep up with what presidential candidates are up to in their quest for your vote. So let's start with Lana Zak, who recently visited Georgia to learn how concerns about the economy are swaying voters as inflation continues to put a strain on American bank accounts. The economy is the issue voters most care about when picking the president. But right now, that's bad news for President Biden. In recent CBS News polling, 63% of those asked disapproved of his handling of the economy. The biggest problem is buying power. Wages have not cut kept up with inflation. As you can see, even though pandemic era inflation has come down from its peak of 9.1% in June of 2022 to 3.7% now, real wages are only up half a percent. Employment has also played an interesting role in voters' perceptions of the economy. When Biden took office, unemployment was at 6.3%, not far from the unemployment rate that prompted Bill Clinton's campaign to adopt the mantra, it's the economy, stupid, in the 1990s. Now at 3.9%, unemployment is near the lowest rate in half a century. There are also other positive economic indicators. Growth is strong. At 4.9% in the third quarter, the U.S. is one of the only major global economies back to pre-pandemic growth. And average Americans also have positive views about some other aspects of the economy in their lives. Job satisfaction is at its highest level in almost 40 years. The great reshuffling moved workers to careers that were more enjoyable, had better wages, or were closer to home. But on a wider scale, voters have a very different view about the national economy. In a CBS News poll conducted last week, a majority viewed the economy as bad. To examine the human experiences behind these economic views, I went to Baldwin County, Georgia, to talk to voters about how they experience the economy every day. We're doing a 250 point checklist on the truck. High beams, low beams, perfect. So we walk around the truck, we make sure everything is on. Barry Mustewick makes his living inspecting fire trucks in Baldwin County, Georgia. Tell me about how the economy feels to you right now. I wouldn't say it's great. I wouldn't say it's bad. I'm doing all right. I mean, I'm living, so that's a good thing. When you are going to the polls, what are the issues that are gonna be most important to you? Economy. Uh, wages for the middle class people. You know, a lot of people are actually doing okay if you look at statistics, but there's this feeling like the economy isn't okay. Yes. What's that about? When I see other people struggling, 
and I just, I feel sorry for those people. But I mean, it, it, it's what you make of it sometimes, I think. Baldwin County was split straight down the middle in the 2020 presidential election. Joe Biden won with about 1% margin of total voters. Do you have data questions? Dr. Caroline Folan studies historic trends in the economy. Does anyone have research questions? On a scale of one to 10, how's the economy doing right now? I think probably eight, something like that. Growth is strong, inflation has fallen. Unemployment is very low. What is the disconnect between how people say they feel about the economy, the uncertainty of it, and these strong economic indicators? So we have people who are still paying a lot more than they were a few years ago, and prices are still rising. So in real terms, a lot of workers are not better off. They're worse off than they were. Are those prices ever going to fall? No. I mean, you might see egg prices fall, but they're not going to go back to $1.50 a dozen. This area was once home to the country's largest mental health hospital. But when it stopped accepting patients in 2009, people lost their jobs. Today, just about 25 percent of the population lives in poverty. Unemployment here hovers around 5 percent. You have a lot of thriving households, two-income families, and then you have elderly, a widow, um, single income. They're, they're, they're making it, uh, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're thriving. Carlos Tobar is the county manager. This year, he's overseeing $20 million in grants, federal and state money, $5 million of which from the Biden administration's bipartisan infrastructure deal. But this is part of the process. You know, a, a neighborhood doesn't come back overnight, and you're going to have some blighted houses in the midst of these houses that have been remodeled, and uh, you just slowly whittle away at the problem. This is your pride and joy, you mm -hmm. say? <laughs> it is this beautiful. Is, thank you. That federal money helped Mary Jackson make repairs to her home. They had to completely take out every bit of it and the wall and all. Mary's home is filled with photos of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and it's also filled with political memorabilia. What are the issues that are most important to you? Mm, the economy is the number one. Where do you feel it the most? Groceries and paying like the light bill. And not only the light bill, water, all the utility bills. You've been here for 82 years. You yes. saw when manufacturing left, yes. when they closed the, the hospital. Yes. Just empty. Yes. To me, that was a sad situation. But I had to do a lot of praying, and that helped me. But you feel like the road ahead is good? I do. I just know the road ahead is good. So the economy is clearly a huge motivator for voters, but then there's what's going on overseas. Foreign policy doesn't usually move the needle until something happens around the world that starts drawing attention. They're drawing attention from people like Ava Borgward, who's Jewish and advocating for the rights of Palestinians, since at least two million of them live in, or are trying to leave, Gaza. We are asking for treating Palestinian lives as sacred as Israeli lives. All lives are sacred. Um, the 4,000 children, their lives, Palestinian children, their lives are sacred. And we're calling on our leaders to, to hear that message. Um, and I was honestly shocked at the level of brutality that this was met with. And honestly, it is completely irresponsible and dangerous for the Democratic Party to be meeting this movement um, for ceasefire um, and for all lives being treated as sacred um, with this level of violent repression. If they care about 2024, and I care because I'm terrified of Donald Trump, and they better care and start listening to our movement and not repressing us with horrific Violence. Our thanks to Ava, a good example of younger voters who are coming to terms with America's role on the global stage and thinking about how it might influence their vote next year. Now another big issue, access to abortion services or the lack thereof now in some states. Recent elections showed how the future of abortion access will keep swaying public opinion. Here's CBS's Jerika Duncan. Abortion rights supporters are still celebrating. 
after voters passed a state constitutional amendment enshrining a woman's right to an abortion in Ohio, setting up a key issue ahead of the 2024 presidential election. The voters said, look, the government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. We have always known that this was a national campaign because what happens in Ohio was going to immediately become the, the flashpoint for way people were talking about issues in other states. In Kentucky, where Republicans control the state legislature, incumbent Democratic Governor Andy Bashir defeated Republican Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Well, that didn't turn out exactly how I wanted it to. Cameron said he would amend the state's total abortion ban if elected to allow for exceptions in cases of rape or incest, but, quote, only if the court made us change the law. In Virginia, Democrats who campaigned on abortion rights took control of the state legislature there. Today, the state's Republican governor, Glenn Youngkin, spoke on the issue. This is a very difficult topic across Virginia and across the nation. Over 20 states either ban or restrict abortion access, but since 2022, abortion rights supporters have prevailed in seven out of seven states where the issue has been on the ballot, including in Ohio last night. I think our country is just getting harder and more selfish, um, and the unborn child is the one that's paying the price. National Right to Life President Carol Tobias says they will continue to fight. There are 11 states right now, as you know, that are considering abortion on the ballot next year. What is your strategy? We have to find different and better ways to, to reach out and get people to understand that uh, killing the unborn child is not going to solve uh, problems. And abortion opponents acknowledge that one of those key strategies is to raise more money, saying they were outspent here in Ohio and in other places where they lost. Jerika Duncan, CBS News. Columbus, Ohio. Those are some voter topics that are resonating a little less than a year before we choose a new president. Now let's catch up with the front runners. President Biden visited California this week to reestablish close ties with China. He hosted Chinese leader Xi Jinping and had this to say about the U.S. China relationship. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which was not a surprise to anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I've never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, the competition. That's what the United States wants and what we intend to do. We also, I also believe that's what the world wants for both of us, candid exchange. We also have a responsibility to our people and the work and the world uh, to work together when we see it in our interest to do so. And a critical global challenge that we face from climate change to counter narcotics to artificial intelligence demand our joint efforts. So I look forward to beginning this discussion, and I welcome you, and the floor is yours, Mr. President. And again, welcome back. This week's visit to California is a good example of how the president plans to run his re-election campaign by demonstrating he is and can continue to be an actively engaged president, especially on big challenges facing the world. The president's facing serious challenges here at home. A recent CBS News poll shows likely opponent, Republican Donald Trump, leading Mr. Biden by a couple points in key battleground states likely to give either contender the 270 electoral votes they need to win. And remember, what's unique about the likely 2024 campaign is that Trump has also been president before, so he's universally known and gets to compare his past policies to Mr. Biden's. And immigration is quickly becoming a way both contenders are trying to compare and contrast. Job number one will be to stop the invasion on our southern border. We also deported illegal alien criminals by the thousands and thousands, and we got them out, MS-13, by the thousands. We slashed illegal immigration by over 90 percent. Think of that. And under Biden, the United States has become the dumping ground of the world, with gang members and inmates being emptied into our 
into our beautiful land, our beautiful country, emptied, tough, tough people. This week on America Decides, members of Team CBS News track the sparring between Biden and Trump. Take a look. President Biden is making access to abortion a key pillar of his reelection campaign. And at a fundraiser last night, he said this, quote, the only reason a fundamental right has been stripped away from the American people for the first time in American history is because of Donald Trump. Those sharp critiques, though, are not keeping former President Trump from sharing his own position on the issue. Here's a new ad he's running in Iowa. Trump nominated conservative judges, leading to Roe v. Wade being overturned and returned to the states. Help make America great again. Caucus for President Trump on January 15th. Joining us now, CBS News campaign reporter Olivia Rinaldi and CBS News immigration reporter Camilo Montoya Galvez. Thank you so much for being here, here at the table with America Decides. We'll begin with abortion. We just heard from former President Trump and President Biden in their respective remarks. Is this issue front and center on the campaign trail when you're covering the Republican race? Yeah, absolutely, Bob. This is front and center for not only the Republican candidates, but for voters as well. And sources that I have within Trump's orbit have told me that they understand this is a really difficult issue for him in 2024. As we saw last week in Virginia, voters overwhelmingly rejected any candidates or provisions, especially in Ohio, that would restrict abortion access for people. They flat out rejected it. So Donald Trump knows that, and that's what he's playing to. He kind of has this twofold approach. When he's speaking to GOP voters in the primary, he is their champion. He's boastful. He's the one who overturned Roe versus Wade by appointing justices to the Supreme Court who delivered it back to the people in the states. But when he's talking to more moderate people and reporters, so Univision in his interview last week, he takes this approach of vagueness. He won't say how many weeks he supports. He won't say 15 weeks. He won't say 20 weeks. And it's that vagueness that really scares Democrats and scares Joe Biden. You heard last night what he said about abortion and that Donald Trump is the person who brought it back to the states. He sees that as a winning issue for him in 2024. It's interesting because he knows perhaps that it's driving out so much turnout for the Democrats, bringing out some non-voters for the Democrats and Speaking of issues that drives turnout, immigration has always yeah. been one, especially for pre former President Trump, in terms of getting working voters to get behind his past campaigns. How is immigration, Camilo, f featuring in his campaign this time around? When you closely watch his speeches, what do you notice about the, the cadence, about the framing of the issue? Well, certainly, former President Donald Trump has made immigration a top campaign issue yet again. He has promised to launch the largest deportation operation in U.S. history, for example, if reelected. He has promised to implement ideological screenings for new immigrants to deny birthright citizenship to the American-born children of unauthorized immigrants. And he has also refused to rule out reinstating that infamous family separation policy along the U.S.-Mexico border. So it has been a prominent theme again in his campaign. But... President Biden's campaign team is telling us now that they see an opportunity here to portray these proposals as draconian, extreme, and radical. And they believe this effort to highlight these proposals, including the mass deportations, will allow them to create some ground here to go on the offensive on this issue, which many perceive to be a political challenge for President Biden due to the record levels of migration along the U.S.-Mexico border and the record numbers of illegal crossings there. And they believe that this effort by Trump to tout this issue will turn off Latino voters and other key voters in 2024, such as moderates and independents. So they're seeking in many ways to flip the script on this issue. But we cannot dismiss the fact that this is one of President Biden's worst polling issues. We had a poll back in September that found that 66 percent of likely voters disapproved of his handling on immigration, including 71 percent of Latino voters. And I think that's due to the fact of the situation along the border, but also the fact that many Latino voters feel like he has not taken enough actions on this issue, including to legalize the undocumented population here. So just in the final uh, minute or two here, when you look at the issue of abortion, speaking of the word script, after what happened in Virginia, you've covered Virginia so much, are Republicans going to start talking less about this on the campaign trail? Have you noticed anything with some of the other candidates beyond Trump? It'll be interesting to see if they cover more 
going forward. It is a losing issue for them, though. And Biden has seen. And they also think it drives turnout on their own side. They do. They really do. That's why some of these evangelicals are saying, keep talking about it. Right. And they don't like when Trump doesn't talk about it. No, they don't like when he doesn't talk about it. And they've pushed him. And sources I've spoken to have said that they've pushed him privately to really define where he is on this issue. You know, Governor DeSantis proudly talks about his six-week abortion ban, or at least did until it reali- he realized that it wasn't really playing that well with some voters. So then he backtracked and said, well, you know, I could be for a 15-week federal ban. There's movement on both of them. Mm-hmm. I really don't think they know what's going to get voters to turn out or they know where, you know, the electorate kind of feels that they're standing on this issue. So I think that will be something we'll be tracking in the coming weeks and months ahead in the primaries. We certainly will. And on immigration, mm-hmm. what should we be tracking it's on the Democrats in particular in just a, a minute well, or so? A longstanding Democratic Party on this issue has been providing a pathway to U.S. citizenship for DREAMers and other longtime unauthorized immigrants here in the U.S. President Biden has not been able to convince Congress to change the immigration laws and to provide that pathway. And that will continue to be a hurdle for him to overcome, to galvanize those Latinos who obviously he needs in 2024. Let's quickly review the rest of the GOP field. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott dropped out of the race this week, leaving just a handful left to try to topple Trump. (laughs) Well, the only tickets that are in the future are with DeSantis at the top. I have no interest in being the number two. It is now the time for us to decide whether America is going to continue down an isolationist, self-absorbed, narcissistic, compromising path or whether we're going to stand up and show the steadfast resolve that this country has always stood for. The one arguably surging the most, at least in recent weeks, is Nikki Haley, the former South Carolina governor and UN ambassador. But first, she's got to shake off less popular, if outspoken, contenders like Vivek Ramaswamy. Do you want a leader from a different generation who's going to put this country first? Or do you want Dick Cheney in three-inch heels? I'd first like to say they're five-inch heels, and I don't wear them unless you can run in them. Um, You have her supporters crapping her up. That's fine. Here's the truth. You're just easy answer. And you know, that exchange at the recent GOP presidential debate in Miami is a reminder. We've seen several examples of tough confrontations among Republicans, not only out on the campaign trail, but also on Capitol Hill. And now it's getting far more personal, as we laid out this week on America Decides. Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. They say the U.S. Senate is the greatest deliberative body in the world, and they refer to the House of Representatives as the People's House. But after today, we might just need to start calling Capitol Hill Fight Club. While we the people face a government shutdown in less than three days amid public concerns about inflation, amid two global crises that require U.S. engagement, and amid polling that continues to show this country more sharply divided than ever before, Elected representatives today literally jabbed each other and picked fights. It began in the House, where during an interview with a radio reporter, Tennessee Republican Congressman Tim Burchett says he was elbowed from behind in the kidneys by none other than the leader of his, former leader of his conference, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Here's what he told our Scott McFarlane about the incident. Kevin McCarthy walked by and he elbowed me in the kidneys as he walked by. You're quite confident this was deliberate. Oh, come on. I'll take, a, I'll take a polygraph test and have Kevin take a polygraph test. McCarthy denies this happened. When I was walking back further, I don't say somebody was interviewing me or talking to me, and he comes running up like, why, why, why did you hit me or something like that? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even know something transpired. Short time later, over on the Senate side of the Capitol, Oklahoma Republican Mark Wayne Mullen and Sean O'Brien, president of the Teamsters Union, nearly came to blows. If you want to run your mouth, we can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold, stop it. Is that your solution every poll? No, no, sit down. Oh, you're a sit down. Okay. You yeah, know, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Active. Oh, okay, okay. Sit down, please. All right. Can I respond? Mr. Hold Shen. it. Hold it. There was also an incident in a hearing of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee where the Republican chairman, James Comer of Kentucky, called Florida Democrat Jared Moskowitz, quote, a smurf. 
So what's coming next? Well, we're now under two months until the Iowa caucus, and New Hampshire has officially set the date for the first in the nation primary, Tuesday, January 23rd. Mark your calendars, cancel your dentist appointments, it's gonna be a big day. We'll be there for those big events and everything before and after. But for now, thanks for watching. I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. If you like what you saw, don't forget to subscribe.